Thank you so much, uh, Gata, and thanks everyone for taking the time to listen to me. Uh, it's always a pleasure to participate uh, in QHack, and I hope you enjoy this talk. I consider myself an unconventional scientist, and one of the many reasons uh, behind this is that I really enjoy giving unconventional talks, and actually QHack is a great venue for unconventional talks, and this is an example of such an unconventional talk. Uh, people that know me, my friends and colleagues, they recognize that I have a tendency for telling very long stories just to make a short point. It's like oh, all that talking just to say that in the end. So I like doing this because then it delivers a lot of context and a good punch to the point. That is exactly what I'm going to do here. I'm not giving you a technical talk. I'm giving you, I'm telling you a story. And I'm telling you that story because I want to make a point. So I could just make that point in one slide. I'm not going to do it. I'm going to talk for 30 minutes and then make my point. And the beginning of the story starts with a preface. And the preface to that story begins with the end of the story. But this is a story that actually hasn't ended yet. So it's more uh, something of the desired ending for the story, which is for Zenidu, the company where I work for, to achieve its mission, to build quantum computers that are useful and available to people everywhere. And it's a mission statement that really does a great job of encapsulating what 150 plus people are working together to achieve. So much so that this is actually in, written in a wall in the office. You may recognize the person on the right who was one of the speakers from yesterday, that Josh Isaac. And it's a big part of what we do and it's definitely uh, a guiding light for a lot of the efforts that we pursue in our daily jobs. Having said that, I this is a community event. There's people joining from around the world, from different disciplines, from different institutions. So I don't want this to be a talk about Sanadu. I want this to be a talk about the community. Uh, and so I actually went through the trouble of thinking, well, what would be something like a mission statement for the entire quantum computing community, especially one that uh, encompasses as well as possible that end goal that we are all after, so that desired ending to this story. And for better or for worse, this is what I came up with. In fact, if any of you have some ideas of what that could look like, I encourage you to think about it. It's a good exercise. But this is my version, that the mission of the entire community of quantum computing is to build quantum computers that are valuable. So this is my take on it, to build quantum computers that are valuable. Let me expand on this to some extent. This keyword that I'm highlighting here of valuable is going to be important throughout the talk. So I want to expand on what I mean by this and why I think it's the correct term to use. Uh, the first and important thing to identify is that there are different facets to something being valuable. And there is one component of quantum computing that, in my opinion, is uncontroversially valuable, which is the contributions of quantum computing uh, to fundamental science. Everything that we do as a community, both in researching and building technologies around quantum computing, is valuable for the same reason that fundamental science, that even the arts are valuable. I'll give you some example of what uh, that, um, that entails. I personally love what quantum computing and quantum information more broadly have done in influencing the way that we teach quantum mechanics. Our understanding of these fundamental rules of, that govern the world, we convey them and we teach them to people, largely influenced more and more, and more modern takes do this, from the principles that arise uh, thanks to researchers thinking about quantum information and quantum computing. Insights and developments from quantum computing have been incorporated in condensed matter, uh, in computational complexity theory, very importantly in quantum foundations, uh, and even quantum gravity. And on a broader sense, and again, in parallel with the value that we get from things like paintings and music and just the arts in general, quantum computing is fascinating. There's a reason that you're all here spending time. You must be, have some degree of fascination with quantum computing. And it's something that continues to inspire and to capture the imagination of people around the world. So just for these reasons, um, quantum computing is valuable and we, we should continue to pursue it. And I hold that as a personal stance. Having said that, that's kind of the easy thing to achieve. This talk is actually the other component of valuable, which is whether quantum computing will be valuable as a commercial 
technology. And what this means is that now we don't get points for being quantum and being fantastic and capturing our imaginations. These things don't really matter. What matters is performance. So we want to know if we can build a technology that is performance and that is worth people using. And so the way that I like to encapsulate it is by saying, look, basically this is the gist of it. If it costs you X in some sense, think X dollars to use a quantum computer, and you are clever enough to leverage that use of your quantum computer to result in some kind of positive return, again, whatever that means, but maybe you have a way of turning that into Y dollars, then basically the quantum computer is valuable if Y is bigger than X. So the question is, uh, how do we achieve this mission of making quantum computers valuable as a commercial technology, meaning that we somehow know how to employ these devices to get more out of them than it costs us to use them. And this is a big guiding principle of the work that I do and that the team that I lead does here at Sanadu. And figuring out how to achieve it is one of the central questions that we try to answer. Uh, now, I want to give you um, the opportunity to put yourself in my shoes and try to answer that question yourself. How would you employ a quantum computer to get more out of it than the costs that it entails to using it? That's exactly this question. Imagine that the problem of building the quantum computer is solved. You wake up tomorrow and there is a large scale full tolerant quantum computer. It has thousands of logical qubits. It has a really high clock rate. So you can do a lot of these operations per second. Essentially, it achieves the dream of the hardware part uh, of the mission. The quantum computers are here. Now the question is, what would you do if you had access to such a device? And I want you to actually take the time to think about it. The quantum computing is there. Uh, there's basically no limitations uh, except fundamental ones on the capabilities of the quantum computer. What do you do with it? And to make it more concrete, why would you pay as a user? to use a fast quantum computer with thousands of logical qubits. Think about it. What would you do? Maybe not yourself, but maybe you can go to some people that could benefit and you can tell them like, hey, this is what you should be doing and you get a cut or something. Do you understand? Do you have good answers to these questions? And I think even if, uh, and of course you can share them in chat. I don't have access to the chat, but maybe it's a way for all of you to interact and learn a bit, a bit more about what you're thinking. But even if, um, even if you have some ideas, I want to also ask you, to what level of detail do you have an answer to this question? For example, I've heard people, when I've asked and I presented this kind of talk, people say like, oh, I want to use a quantum computer to discover a room temperature superconductor. Well, give me more details. How? How what are you running? How are you going to achieve this? How does it actually work in details? And, and details, are important. Um, and so I want to bring attention to this uh, quote. It's from the paper, Elucidating Reaction Mechanisms on Quantum Computers. And this is a quote from a summary of the significance of the paper that appears in the online version. So I invite you to take a look. And I'm going to read from this quote. Specifically, it's a paper on applications of quantum computing to quantum chemistry. And it reads as follows. Although quantum chemistry is a strong candidate for a killer application of quantum computing, the lack of details of how quantum computers can be used for specific applications makes it difficult to assess whether they will be able to deliver on the promises. And this is one of my favorite uh, papers because it's one of the first that has a serious attempt at answering the question of what would you do with a quantum computer if you can build it that has the most impact and extracts the most value in the world. So that's the uh, part of the preface to the story that I'm telling you. Uh, but let's go back to the question of what to do with a quantum computer. And you see, I, I'm, I'm going to argue that we don't have a good answer to this question. It's essentially an open problem for the field. And the reason that we don't have a convincing and comprehensive answer is that it's, in fact, a very difficult question. Turns out science is very difficult if you're really trying to push the frontiers. And there's many reasons why this is difficult, but one of the main challenges is that we need to understand 
application areas, so what we're going to use a quantum computer for, we need to understand the existing classical methods that we're trying to compete against. And importantly, we need to understand advanced concepts of quantum algorithms that teach us how to actually program the quantum computer to perform these tasks. So it's inherently interdisciplinary research, and most experts don't share all of these uh, different expertise. And so it really requires special teams like the one that we have assembled here at Sanadu to, uh, to tackle these questions in full seriousness. And so it's very difficult to achieve that. That's the preface. I'm gonna tell you a story of the road that we have taken in my team and more generally inside of Sanadu in our quest to find this valuable quantum algorithm. So remember, it's a set of instructions on how to program a quantum computer that can tackle a problem in such a way that we get more from that solution than the cost of actually using the device. And so it gives us a direct reason to use quantum computers where it doesn't really matter that it's quantum and it's fascinating, it's because we have access to performance and increased computational capabilities. So I'm gonna tell you the story of the road that we have taken in search for this valuable quantum algorithm. And this is a story that I wanna tell as a collection of crossroads, meaning we're gonna go through a certain path and at some point we're going to have to make a decision on where to look for this valuable quantum algorithm. And so at each crossroad, there will be a decision on where to go. And what I want you to remember is that each decision that we have made in this story that I'm telling you should be interpreted as a bet. So just as if you're exploring and doing a search, you actually don't know the way, you're not following a map, you're trying to discover something. Uh, so you don't have an assurance that you're going the right way, but you do the best that you can to give yourself the highest chance of success. So that's really how you should interpret it. And many of you may have actually different um, kind of answers of what direction you would take. So this is our story that we're following. And so we start at the first crossroad, the general application area. What kind of problems are we going to try to solve? There's several of them, but I'm illustrating two main ones, quantum machine learning, of which you have heard a lot during QHack, and quantum chemistry. And as I guide you through the story of the road that we have taken, I want to share with you some of the mental models that have guided uh, the directions that we take and have guided the decision-making that happens in, in following specific paths down these crossroads. So the first mental model is the following, is that any legitimate and valuable application of quantum computing needs to satisfy essentially three main uh, properties. A, it should be very impactful to industry, meaning there are large groups of people uh, that are working hard to build better products and better services, and they can really benefit from solutions to these problems that we are targeting. Second, we should be looking at the problems that are quote unquote hard for classical methods, meaning people should really be struggling to find good solutions to these problems. Otherwise, there's no need for a quantum computer. We already have good techniques. So we should be looking for problems that are hard for classical, but it's not enough for these two. We also need somehow for those problems to be easier on a quantum computer, tractable. So really this hardness for classical and easy for quantumness, you can think of it as there's some kind of potential for something resembling a quantum advantage. And it's only when these three things come together that you have a good potential application of quantum computing. And I wanna share something. I've talked to a lot of people doing uh, working on applications of quantum computing and quantum algorithms, and there are some classic mistakes that I see that I can identify. You're probably not using, the, you're not having the best use of your resources. Um, this is a direction you probably shouldn't be pursuing. And they boil down to these main three. One is uh, an underestimation of the potential of classical algorithms. So you think that something is hard for classical, but actually it isn't. You just don't know how good the best uh, techniques are. Second, you can overestimate quantum algorithms. So you think like, wow, the quantum computer is definitely gonna solve this problem amazingly. But if you actually look into the details, once again, it's a recognition that, well, actually it's not so easy for quantum computers. Um, and, and lastly, it's misunderstanding industry needs. So you're thinking, oh, this is the problem that's really going to be impactful, that is going to really be valuable for people to solve. And it turns out that if upon further scrutiny, that's not actually the case. So I invite you, those of you that are working, uh, or maybe thinking of working along these directions, to not make these mistakes. Certainly we try not to make these mistakes. And so there was an exercise um, that we did globally, but I'm trying to illustrate here 
of literally looking at candidate applications of quantum computing. This list, which is absolutely not exhaustive, uh, I took it from a quick Google search. Applications quantum computing and see what things actually show up. And what I'm going to do is essentially categorize them in terms of how much potential they have as applications of quantum computing based on these principles. Are they impactful to industry? Are the problems really hard for classical methods? And are those problems actually tractable and easier for quantum? And essentially, this um, classification looks something like this. Now, this is a provocative slide. I am hoping for people to have some kind of reaction and for there to be some controversy, which is about, uh, of course, inducing some discussion and some thought. But if there was some coarse graining of which are strong candidates and which are weak candidates, this is my personal uh, assessment and filtering. Uh, basically, the strong ones are breaking public key crypto using uh, factoring uh, algorithms and related algorithms that are part of the main reason that we got interested in quantum computing in the first place, but then also applications related to batteries, catalysts, photovoltaics, which are actually um, really encompassing examples of using quantum computers in the context of quantum chemistry and potentially material science as well. And there's different things like machine learning, different things like optimization, like finance, that are um, weaker candidates. And I'm trying to outline the main reasons why that's the case. For example, finance turns out that the problems that we want to solve there are not that easy for quantum computers to solve when you actually look into it. Same for optimization. Uh, and you look at machine learning, and well, one of the issues there is that the existing methods are absolutely remarkable. And so the, the, the need for improved techniques is a bit more questionable. People are not struggling. They're actually triumphing a lot. Now, like I said, this is a provocative slide. Um, I have also a more nuanced um, way of referring to this, where, of course, it's not just black and white. There's actually a picture of different potential applications. And the way that I've tried to summarize it is in, uh, in this graphic, where on the y-axis, we have something with the potential for industrial impact. So this is really looking at this red set of applications that are really impactful for industry. And then you see, for example, that something like actually simulation of classical systems uh, is not that strong because people have a lot of good techniques already developed. Yeah. And then potential for quantum advantage is trying to capture precisely this tension between how well we can do things with classical methods versus how well we expect to be able to tackle them with quantum. Yeah. So I would argue, for example, that when it comes to uh, cryptanalysis, breaking public key uh, cryptography, the industry impact is not enormous. There are probably people like governments that would be interested in these capabilities, but it's not quite the solution to the most important problems uh, the world is facing. Having said that, the potential for quantum advantage is as well established as it comes. Conversely, solving optimization problems has obviously immense impact, but it's just very unclear whether this is something where quantum computing can really help, uh, and so forth. And so based on this more nuanced picture, and again, it's not comprehensive in including all of these more detailed um, application areas, our conclusion is that that's problem of simulation of quantum systems and when it comes to industrial relevance, it's really looking at quantum chemistry, they seem overall like having most of the components that we want, even if it's not completely clear. The industrial impact is not off the charts and that potential for quantum advantage is still somewhat unclear. But based on this analysis, we're gonna make uh, a call. And I should say in our team, we also focus uh, on batteries specifically, um, but I won't go too much into these details. You should know, however, that internally at Sanadu, we're not just thinking about chemistry, but specifically about applications to batteries. In our story of our search for a valuable quantum algorithm, in this first crossroad, we're gonna take a right, and we're gonna go to quantum chemistry. And again, this is a bet. You've heard from Maria as well. Her team is actually saying like, hey, maybe we go on the left-hand side, and it's gonna be a difficult road, but there's a huge potential. So these are bets that we're making. And now we find ourselves facing a second uh, crossroad, a second fork on the road. What type of algorithm, even if we have identified a specific application area, uh, what technique are we actually going to leverage in, in, the, in the quantum computer? And really, what can we expect in terms of the capabilities of the quantum computers themselves? Uh, and again, I try to summarize it by saying like, well, either we look at NISC uh, algorithms, so those that are really 
tailored to having few noisy qubits. Or maybe we say like, look, we're going to have access to the full capabilities of a full turn quantum computer. And we're going to actually think of implementing those type of algorithms. Now, this is a distinction that I don't love. There's a lot of NISC versus fault tolerance that I think is uh, problematic, and I'm potentially contributing it to it, but this is more to illustrate a point. And now I'm gonna give you um, a summary of what it means to follow either of these paths. Now, the problem of focusing too heavily with NISC, and especially what we can do with NISC devices, is in my uh, opinion, that noise is too problematic it is extremely limiting in what we can do with the quantum computer and on the quality of the results that we obtain. And of course, classical algorithms are really good. Now, the problem with fault tolerant quantum computers is that they don't exist. So we will be working in algorithms for machines that we, we can't actually deploy them on. And once again, we need to remember that classical algorithms are too good. So this is a tough decision to make, and these are difficult roads to follow. But I'm going to share with you another mental model, which is I like to think about, again, different classes of algorithms. Those that are practical, and here practicality means capability of actually implementing it uh, in practice. That's what it means. So how, how close are we to actually being able to implement them? So you could think of this as well as implementable algorithms. And then there's also performance algorithms, namely those that have such strong performance that there's a stronger case for a potential quantum advantage. And of course, what we want is algorithms that are both algorithms that we can implement in practice and that are highly performant. And not all algorithms fall um, exactly at this intersection. For example, you could argue that, roughly speaking, the philosophy behind these different approaches is that NISC type algorithms are focused on the practicality, even if they're not necessarily very performant. Whereas fault tolerant algorithms, they are actually targeting the highest level of performance on quantum computing even if they're not quite so practical. So in that goal of finding an algorithm that's valuable because it's both practical and performant, you can start from either direction and then work towards getting to that intersection. You could try to make NISC algorithms more performant, or you could try to make fault tolerant algorithms more practical and obviously more performant as well. Now, as exemplary algorithms, especially in the case of quantum chemistry, which is where we're working, uh, you may have heard of VQE and QPE quantum phase estimation. So you could think that we could start from VQE type algorithms and try to make them more performant or work from quantum phase estimation algorithms and make, sorry, make them uh, more practical. But you see, especially when it comes to the simulation of quantum systems and as it entails to quantum chemistry, roughly speaking, any algorithm that you can devise will have two main components. At some point, your quantum computer will have prepared a state of interest, for example, a ground state. And at some point, you'll need to extract information from a state, for example, the ground state energy. And so what happens is that if you look at that second point, which is actually one that, in my opinion, is underestimated overall in the community, so if you look at the ability to extract information, and especially if you look at large systems, which are those that are challenging to simulate with classical techniques, it's actually really difficult to find a better and cheaper method than quantum phase estimation. Now, uh, I tweeted this out at some point. This is a real actual question that we ask in interviews. Suppose that you have uh, a method that solves that state preparation problem. Do you just have a magic box that prepares the ground state of a quantum, sorry, of a Hamiltonian on a quantum computer? The question is, how do you best calculate the expectation value uh, of the Hamiltonian on that state? And Henry Yuen, who you may know, is a professor of theoretical computer science at Columbia, he replied, well, just use phase estimation. And kind of thinking like, duh, like, like that's such a silly thing to say in an interview. But it's actually the best answer that we have, right? This is coming from a top expert in the world. And, and, and I invite you, if you haven't thought about this too much, to perform a detailed analysis of the cost of extracting information uh, from a state, for example, an expectation value. And it really is very difficult to beat the capabilities that we have in quantum phase estimation. So if you're under the impression that this is an algorithm that's really expensive and it takes a long time, well, it turns out it's one of the most efficient ones that we have. Yeah, it's just that kind of cost comes in different flavors. But ultimately, this is one of the cheapest uh, methods that we can actually have, especially if you're targeting also high accuracy. So that's a big 
reason to actually go towards an analysis of these type of algorithms. These are the most powerful ones that we can have and we can work to make them more performant. Now, you may see that I have this in between uh, road, ISK. This is something that I coined actually, uh, but people in the literature refer to this as early fault tolerance as well. And this is kind of an intermediate regime where you have something like a few logical qubits that have some error correction capability, but not fully so. So there's, there's a question that maybe this is the right way to think about uh, quantum computing, and maybe that's the road to take for valuable. But I'm just going to tease it. I'm not going to go down that road. We're taking the right, this treacherous and uphill battle that we're going to be facing, but we're brave and we're going to go there. Now, finally, and I think somewhat less important, is even if we're targeting quantum chemistry applications, and even if we're roughly going to be focused on quantum phase estimation, there's actually different flavors for example, there are uh, techniques based on first quantization that are very uniquely tailored for quantum computing, something that really doesn't happen classically. And there's some really advanced uh, techniques. This is not tetrahydrocannabinol. Uh, this is actually tensor hypercontraction, very sophisticated quantum algorithms that have emerged. So there's a whole variety of different flavors of quantum phase estimation that we also have to choose in our road towards the valuable quantum algorithm. Uh, I'll give you a very quick overview. There's different ways of representing the systems. We can choose either first or second quantization. Um, the, uh, there's always a question of an underlying basis set. This is a discretization of continuous functions that define, for example, orbitals. So we can choose something like plane waves, or we can choose localized atomic orbitals. There are questions of how we map fermionic operators to qubits. And in regards to quantum phase estimation, there are questions of how do we encode a Hamiltonian into a unitary whose faces we are estimating to retrieve information about the eigenvalues of the Hamiltonian, for example, the ground state energy. And there's a series of very different approaches, which is the one that we're going to employ. And remember what I mentioned about the importance of details. We don't get to just say, oh, we'll use quantum phase estimation. And that's it, that's the algorithm. We have to be specific about all this, the, the components that constitute our algorithm. And we need to make a strong case of why it's actually valuable. But we make a choice, and I won't tell you a lot of the details, but we were internally persuaded that specifically when it comes to simulation of materials, which is crucial for batteries, these new techniques and first quantization, specifically in a plane wave basis, and using what's known as a qubitization encoding are the best approach. The main idea, and it's a bit of a technical thing, but I'm going to mention it anyway, plane waves are great for these type of systems, but they are prohibitive unless we use first quantization, so really it's a pair um, that come hand in hand, plane waves and first quantization. And for problems that need very high accuracy, which we want to achieve if we hope to outperform what classical methods can achieve, then typically computation is unmatched in terms of the cost in order to achieve high accuracy. Now, the problem of these techniques is that state preparation is more complicated. But uh, that's the direction that we're taking. So we're going left in this crossroad, right? So we're going to be working on quantum chemistry. We're going to be looking at fault and quantum algorithms, and we're going to specifically be looking at techniques in first quantization. And so that raises the question, is this the end of the story? Is our quest completed? Do we actually know uh, what to do with a quantum computer? Do we know why people would pay to use a quantum computer? For example, because they can perform quantum phase estimation using techniques in first quantization in a plane wave basis to simulate materials or batteries that can help them build better batteries that can help us have things like um, more efficient electric vehicles and better techniques for um, energy storage on the grid. Is that it? Have we actually done this? Well, that's the question that we try to answer. And you can see some of the details uh, in this particular paper. That's a very unique paper. It's another example of the unconventional aspects that I think uh, characterize me and the team as scientists, where we are just answering that question. How does it look like to use a quantum computer to simulate a battery? For example, using these techniques that we have identified as the most promising, which are, by the way, based on this paper that I'm uh, highlighting here, which is collaboration between the Google, the Google team and other people in academia as well. It's a really fantastic paper that I like a lot. And so we do this, we do an analysis, we explain every single step of the algorithm, and importantly, we can compute its cost. Now, it's a bit of another technical slide, but in the context of fault tolerance, you make a distinction between gates that are easy to implement in a fault tolerance setting and those that are costly. The costly ones are the non-Clifford gate, of which Toffoli gates are um, one example. And in our algorithm, they are the, by far the dominant type of non-Clifford gate. So if you count the number of Toffoli gates that appear in your algorithm, you're essentially counting how many difficult steps there are and therefore capturing the cost of the algorithm. So that's the y-axis of this plot. 
Uh, we also include aspects of initial state preparation for um, for this algorithm, specifically how difficult it is to prepare a simple state like the Hartree Fox state. And importantly, the number of qubits, and these are logical qubits for the simulation, is a few thousand. And it depends on the number of plane waves. And as you can see, targeting different errors, and essentially this 0 0.01 for electron volts is a very small error, and then 0.38 is a higher error. Um, and then different plane waves give you better representation of this orbital. So the more plane waves you have, the more accuracy you have at the end. And these are the numbers uh, that we obtain. So you can see they look something like billions to trillions of autofolic gates, which is a high number. It's a high number. Of course, if this was a, an algorithm for a classical device, for example, this laptop operates um, on, on which I'm giving this talk will operate at gigahertz. So this would take something like thousands of seconds, maybe 10,000 of seconds. Uh, so a few hours, it's not that scary, but for a quantum computer, well, it will depend a lot on the capabilities of the quantum computers themselves, but these are large numbers. So you can ask the question, uh, well, is this an issue of the choice? Maybe we made a wrong turn. Maybe we actually chose the wrong type of algorithms. But well, let's take a look. This paper that I highlighted, they do a similar analysis, and the details don't matter too much, but you can look at the y-axis and see like, well, we're also looking at something like you know billions to trillions of gates, depending on different accuracy. And there's this paper from our competitors at PsyQuantum, where again, they look at different type of problems they would like to simulate in the context of uh, quantum chemistry. And you see, well, it's also like billions of, of gates as well. Uh, this is another paper from the team at Google. They're comparing quantum algorithms to some specific classical ones based on this technique of DMRG. The y-axis is now time, but it's looking like you know tens to hundreds of hours. Um, and so the cost is pretty significant. Yeah. And so, so it's not clear at all that the, the quest has been completed. We are in a situation where there are algorithms that are very performant, but they're still quite expensive. In fact, there are several challenges that remain, like preparing initial states. Uh, it's very difficult to do those, to prepare states that have a high overlap with the ground states. And that's an important problem that's often not addressed in these works. Now, we are confident that it's possible to further reduce the cost of quantum algorithms, but it's not clear by how many orders of magnitude. And either way, having fast quantum computers will be crucial. If there are very few logical operations that you can do per second, then it's going to take too long to implement these type of algorithms. Um, and I should say, one um, uh, something I would have hoped to be able to share with you is a new paper that we have coming soon, where we actually already reduced the cost of simulating these battery materials by orders of magnitude using some techniques on pseudo potentials that I'm pretty excited about. Now, this brings me to a final mental model where, remember, we're thinking about these valuable quantum algorithms and potential killer applications. So at least when it comes to chemistry, what I'm starting to understand, and I think the team is starting to understand, is that what that may look like, it's not that we're just going to directly solve important problems, but what is available to us as, as people working in quantum computing is something that's going to be likely more closer to increasing the chances for scientists that are working to perform breakthroughs, for example, in designing better batteries and constructing better catalysts and more efficient photovoltaic cells, that you have a better chance of succeeding in doing this because you have access to very expensive but very accurate simulation methods. So we're giving them a higher chance of success, and that is a very valuable thing that you can pay for. Right? because you put yourself in a better situation to achieve a very important goal. And so remember when I started this story telling you that I wanted to make a point? So I'm going to make the point. The point of this entire talk is that we need even better quantum algorithms. This is the one thing that I want you to take, and especially those of you that are young scientists in the field, I want to motivate you to consider pursuing some of your talents and your efforts to accompany us in this quest of understanding how to build uh, valuable quantum algorithms and valuable quantum computers because we have work that still needs to be done and it's difficult work and it's going to take time and it's going to take a lot of effort but this is what making real scientific technological progress actually looks like and this is a big motivation of what we're trying to do and it's a big summary of the work that we do inside of my team. We need better quantum algorithms, and I'm hoping that we all work with seriousness and dedication and with a big attention to details to achieve it. That's it for me. Thank you very much.
Thank you. Thank you so much, Juan Miguel. Uh, I, th I think everybody got the final message, right? Um, we need people coming into this field with an open and critical mind and looking at these crossroads in a like with a new light. Let us not just go forward with everything that we've done already, but look at these crossroads and make active decisions on where to go, right? We need better quantum algorithms. That's what we need. We also need really good quantum computers. Uh, so, so we need to work towards that. If, if, if the dream of quantum computing being a commercial technology that is really impactful, if that's going to happen, then there's still work to be done. I find that both challenging and very motivating, but the work needs to, to happen. Right? And we have to do serious work to get there. That's, that's the point. I agree. And that's actually a huge reason to get into the field. We are at a moment where we can change the field. It's evolving so fast that everything you do will have an impact. And that is a, that's a really good motivation for me to get into a field mm -hmm. that is new and changing. Um, so now uh, getting to know you a little bit better. Uh, sure. I know you're a great fan of table tennis. So how good yes. are you really? How good are you? <laughs> how good am I really? Um, so I'm, I consider myself an intermediate level player. Now, those that have played uh, against me may disagree with that, but I've actually had the fortune. So I, I do love table tennis. This is the sport that I, I've tried a lot of sports in my life, and this is the one that I have a true love for. It's a beautiful, fascinating, and extremely fun sport uh, or game, as some people would criticize. Um, and I've, I've taken some time you know, to, to actually get some training and to get some of the kind of basic technical skills on how to, to do this. If Robert Huang is in the audience, he can tell you when we play together uh, that I know a thing or two. But in reality, people that have real training, that have actually played and are competitive, they absolutely destroy me. I cannot touch them. And I've played against such players. So I, I, I used to train here in Toronto with a guy that was, you know, he told me he didn't even make it to top uh, 1,000 in all of China. Uh, and he's like not even top 100 in Canada. And he I couldn't win a single game against him. So I'm not that good, but if I play against like beginners, then there's just a huge gap of skills. And table tennis is a sport where like, it's a lot of tricks and understanding of how the game actually works. And if you don't possess them, then you really just can't compete against somebody that does it. So I'm intermediate. If you're a beginner, I will beat you very consistently. If you're a really advanced player, then I'm going to have a hard chance, but I can maybe give you a hard time. Just for context for everybody, <laughs> Juan Miguel beats everybody in the office. We have done three table tennis tournaments, singles. That's right. And he has won all of them. Uh, That's right. Um, I remember the last final, I was there front row seats. It was also streamed for everybody at Zanada to watch. So very fun. That's right. <laughs> um, yeah, maybe... I like to joke. I like to joke that one of my uh, greatest contributions to, to the company has been to actually buy good tables and good paddles and good balls to, to play. Um, so, so there's, it's been from a long time and, I, and I'm lucky that our CEO loves to play as well. So he supports all these efforts, but it's, it's part of working at Sanadu to like have fun, uh, playing table tennis and we celebrated with some tournaments. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. I would say it's a company sport, uh, and yeah. our CEO, is, you'll find them playing everybody. So that's cool. Juan Miguel personally beat me, uh, very easily. I'm just a very beginner, but he has all of the tricks. <laughs> definitely a cool sport um and uh changing a little bit of the topic i love your mm -hmm. background and right before we started the talk you turned your camera a little bit and showed me something that was hidden underneath yeah yeah yeah. so um that right there is tanuki Tanooks. and he's turning for the camera so cute uh, yeah so he so first, the background is really my, my wife. Uh, she's, she's the one that has that eye for, for beauty and aesthetics that I support, obviously. So I, I enjoy living in a beautiful home. Uh, so I appreciate it. Yeah, we have, uh, he's a rescue dog from Texas. He has a really difficult uh, backstory where he was uh, abandoned in basically uh, a desert around the, um, like some ranches in, in Texas where people would just dump garbage. So they dumped him, his brother, and his mother. He was found basically fighting for his life. We found some footage, actually, of people that rescued him. Uh, and he's a difficult dog. 
he's a freaking difficult dog that is has anxiety and he really doesn't like to be left alone and he's not comfortable with other people having uh having people over when he's here is is a big challenge because he's just very uncomfortable so it's been very difficult but he's also the kind of dog that when he is just the three of us at home it's just incredibly loving and loyal and smart and amazing so it's like it's been a really big roller coaster of emotions with him that's for sure oh uh that's nice to hear and uh now at uh, q hack we've seen cats and dogs uh so <laughs> that's good <laughs> now we have a couple of minutes for questions from the chat so keep asking your questions our first question is from sai ganesh manda uh they asked i think the reason quantum entanglement seems instantaneous in time is probably because it's propagating through some higher dimensional space or rather space time where it doesn't break any causality but seems to do so in a murky three dimensional space would you agree with this um no i'm not sure i would agree it's a bit of a curveball question um no I, i think entanglement can be more mundane than that i know people have explored things like this epr equals um ER I think so there's connection between wormholes and entanglement and there's a whole kind of crazy rabbit hole that you can go to but um I'm not sure that's necessarily the way to understand entanglement yeah but I'm happy to take other questions that are maybe closer to uh, to the talk we have a ton of questions about a ton of different topics so we'll get the <laughs> okay. chance to okay then I'll do my best yeah. um uh then Toki Kirby asks not every innovation but certainly a lot of innovations are world changing because constraints spawn creativity. Do you think this is mm -hmm. why there isn't a consensus on what we can do with the power for quantum computer? Do we need more constraints or do you think it's more likely that we happen upon something world changing sort of accidentally? I mean, it's a great question. Um, I don't think it's lack of constraints. I think we're pretty constrained. For example, I'm constrained to work with devices that don't exist. So I don't think it's a lack of constraints. I know I know where the question is coming from. So indeed, constraints can be a great way to fuel creativity. But I'm not sure this is the problem right here. Um, I think my 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 stance is that I think uh, okay. So I'm going to get a bit philosophical with this, but I, I find that we live in a very particular time when a lot of us have been spoiled by technological progress that makes it feel like it's easy. Like 10, 20 years ago, like cell phones did not look anything at all like current smartphones. And there's just all this kind of constant improvement. So we can just continue to do that. But the reality is that um, this is extremely difficult to achieve. It does take time. And in certain areas, uh, it's, it's it's harder than in others. So so quantum computing is unique in how difficult it is to build quantum computers and also in how challenging it can be to think about them. Uh, so it's so it's, so it's just it's difficult. There's an added degree of difficulty that I don't think necessarily occurs in all different fields of technology and innovation. So that's one aspect of it. Um, and the second, of course, is that um, underlying everything that we want to achieve in quantum computation is the fact that we already have computers. Yeah, like I'm giving this talk on my laptop, and we have on our cell phones, and I have like large supercomputers. There's like GPUs, TPUs. So so there's like this vast competition as well uh, and that makes also things very hard so so i think just a matter of of difficulty ultimately that is what we have to overcome and and science and technology can be difficult to make progress but not impossible just needs a lot of efforts and dedication to achieve it um so that's that's definitely one point but the other one is that to be honest we haven't been trying that hard either so the number of people that have truly put a lot of effort into working in, in quantum algorithms is very limited. I think you can probably count them in, in, in double digits. I don't think it grows to, to, to triple digits necessarily. So, so it's not this incredibly big push that we've done. We've certainly done it more on the hardware, which I think it's crucial because without the hardware, everything else is a bit of science fiction. So it's important, um, but we haven't tried that hard actually. And it's one of the reasons for me to try to give this these talks is to uh, try to steer some of the efforts of the community to working towards the problems that, that really matter. Yeah. So it's very difficult and we haven't tried hard enough. I think that's kind of the best summary of the challenges here. Yeah. yeah, thank you. 
Thank you for your answer. We have mm -hmm. NHOC in Seattle asking, is the model of quantum computing a crossers or do we just assume gate model? That's a good question. Um, in, in the approach that we have at the stage and at the level that I explained uh, uh, in this talk, we are not thinking about how um, physically a quantum computer is realized. Uh, this is uh, under the, the model that people that are building the quantum computers have done it in such a way that I can still think of it as a collection of qubits on which I, I can apply a sequence of operations that apply a computation. So any algorithm that I design should be possible to implement in the device, regardless of how it's actually built. Um, and I think that supplies more broadly in quantum computing that there's a lot of questions of how to best build a quantum computer, but I'm not sure that our insights from quantum algorithms should depend too much on how that physical implementation of quantum computers is actually realized. The whole goal of building the quantum computer is that once you do that, it shouldn't matter from the perspective of people that want to program them. They should be able to do it just by thinking about qubits uh, and operations of qubits. So uh, it's, it's a crossroad for the experimentalists more than for the theorists, perhaps. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much, Juan Miguel. Um, everybody, make sure to ask your questions also on the Discord. Um, Juan Miguel, if you can answer the questions on the Discord, I know everybody would be very happy uh, to uh, read your answers to be able to chat with you as well. Um, you know where to find the Discord. Uh, you can find the link here in the Twitch mm -hmm. chat. And also, if you go to the qhack.ai website, if you click on join the discussion after you register, there you'll uh, go to the Discord. So thank you again, Juan Miguel. This was thank you so much. Uh, a really great talk. I hope everybody learned a lot from it. And uh, we got our uh, key mission uh, very mm -hmm in our heads to develop better quantum algorithms. Thank you, Juan Miguel. Wonderful. Thank you so much, everyone, for saying. And I'll be in the Discord, indeed, answering some questions for some time. Have a great one, and enjoy the rest of QHack.